Bonjour à tous. Donc aujourd'hui, nous avons la chance de recevoir le professeur Roger Penrose. Et donc, je vais parler en anglais, bien sûr, pour tout le monde. Uh, as you may know, Roger Penrose is a mathematician, theoretical physicist, cosmologist. And I think he's mostly what I would call a thinker in the broad sense. And he has a, a lot of ideas about the brains, about the universe, about collapse of the wave function, sometimes which are a little bit um, controversial. And I think uh, all what he has been doing in the last years helped us to think about what we take for granted in physics. So Roger started uh, as a student. I mean, even as a student, you started to make discoveries. If, I rem if you, t you told me, I think you discovered some kind of uh, inverse matrix, a new kind of inverse matrix when you were oh, yeah. a student. Yeah, yeah. And then he did his PhD in, uh, in Cambridge. He was working on uh, 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 differential geometry uh, techniques in, uh, in algebraic uh, in, 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 in algebra, in algebraic geometry. And uh, so that was in the end of the 50s. Uh, in mathematics, he's also very famous because in 74 he discovered what is called the Penrose tiling. So this, uh, uh, which are which were discovered with quasi crystal in the, in the 80s. And if you go to Cambridge at the Math Institute on the floor, you will see your, your tiling uh, at the entrance of the, of the, math, the math buildings. Uh, Roger has many uh, contributions in general relativity in, by developing a lot of mathematical techniques that help us think general relativity in a different ways. So it started with uh, the definition of trap surface, the singularity theorem. And I remember some years ago when we discussed in London, you told me we were crossing the road and you told me the idea of trap surface appears to you while crossing the road. You had a discussion with Ian Robinson and crossing the road, you had the idea that there may exist surface that you can cross in what direction and not to the other. And then you had to go back to the, to the institute to work out the maths and to define the, the notion of trap surface. And then this work continues with Stephen Hawking to, the, to lead to the singularity theorem and you got the, the Adams uh, prize for this with, uh, with Stephen. Then you went up by, with uh, working on the cosmic censorship and this famous formalism with, uh, with Neumann on the, to study the, the gen, I mean, general solution of the, uh, the, the Einstein equations. Concerning quantum gravity, he developed the twister theory, which is a different way to think about the world. Instead of taking points, you work in a kind of dual space where you have light cones at central elements. And it lets you to think a lot, of, a lot about the connection between quantum gravity, uh, gra gravity and quantum physics. And in particular, you had this model of the collapse of the wave function induced by self-gravity. And when we discussed yesterday, you told me that you think that it, it can be tested experimentally in five or ten years from... Oh, less than that. Less than that, okay. Yes. Two or three years. And so it leads him to have many ideas, in particular in the brain, the connection between the brain's physics and quantum physics, with some ideas on consciousness. And as you may know, if you have read his books, you will realize that he is really a platonist. He believes on the existence of all these ideas, mathematical ideas. And uh, today we'll talk about cosmology and his new model about uh, cyclic universe, the Hawking points that may be detectable in the universe. And as he was telling me, while working on this issue, he lost a lot of good friends <laughs> because of these ideas. And I think that uh, this is very debatable and somehow controversial, but it helps us think about the initial state of our universe, how do we describe the Big Bang, and the connection in particular with the validity of, of inflation. And on the top of that, as you may know, he has also written a lot of popular books. I think this is the only person I know that allows himself to put a lot of equations in popular science books, which is to me like uh, something, when you know editors, you know that this is a, a real achievement. So thank you for being there. So after the seminar, uh, around three o'clock, uh, Roger will be back here, and it, there is a small gathering, in particular with PhD students and postdocs, but you are all welcome to, to discuss with him afterwards. He will have to leave around 5, 5 uh, a.m. To, to catch his train back to London. PM, PM, j'ai dit AM. Okay. I'm allowed to be jet lagged, okay? Well, this is you. your turn, thank you. Thank you very much, yes. Thanks for inviting me, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm not sure whether what I want to say is controversial. That is to say, I don't think it's got to that point. It's mostly ignored. <laughs> so controversial will be a step in the right direction, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, I want to talk about these things that I call Hawking points. And I have to explain what they are. 
First of all, perhaps I will give you a clue. Um, those spots are meant to be hawking points, maybe. Uh, I claim that if you could see the night sky with microwave eyes, if you could be sensitive to the microwave radiation, you would see these spots, which would be about eight times the diameter of the moon and more intense by a factor of about 15 than the standard variations in temperature that you see in the microwave background. So why are they not seen? I don't know. I think it's because people don't look. If people had looked for them, they would have seen them. Anyway, let me try and explain what they are. OK, so this is the first picture. You don't really need this picture because you know about these things already. But that's the space-time sketch of the history of the universe, um, where time is going upwards, and sections through, through this picture, of course, represent what you might think of as a moment in time. And let me go back a minute. I should explain. You might worry about the frilly part on the back. What's that doing? That is really because I don't want to prejudice the issue as to whether this space, spatially, it's flat, as top left, positively curved, top right, or negatively curved. And you see all these things illustrated in those famous pictures due to the Dutch artist M.C. Escher. I'll come back to these things, particularly the bottom one, because not that I believe that the universe is negatively curved, especially. From my perspective, it may make a big difference. But as far as I, anything I'm going to say today, I don't know what the difference is. So you can forget about the spatial geometry. It could be one or the other. And the argument is that the it's frilly bit at the back is just that it may close up or it may not. I don't care. OK. Now, one thing you might think is missing from this picture is inflation would be right tucked in at the bottom. And of course, um, if it were depicted in this picture, inflation would be in that little black spot at the bottom and you wouldn't see it. But there's another reason that I haven't depicted it, and that is that I don't really believe it. And if you don't believe it, you have to, the good things that inflation does, you have to have other explanations for. Well, I'll come to some of those. But first of all, let's have a look at the black spot. And that means we need a powerful magnifying glass and the, what you see in the magnifying glass, I should explain top right is the handle of the magnifying glass, not anything in the cosmological model. Uh, but you see something which is very similar, according to inflation, to the exponential expansion that we are already seeing, but at a completely different level of scale in the ultimate uh, expansion of the universe, which seems to be consistent with a lambda term in Einstein's equations. And that will be my perspective that the inflationary, I'm sorry, the, the uh, cosmic expansion that we seem to see in the very late universe is the result of a positive cosmological constant. And I'm going to take that view. And as far as I'm aware, it's completely consistent with observations up to the moment. But on the other hand, I don't want to have inflation. It would be cause me all sorts of problems and would be inconsistent with some of the things I say. So we'll come back to this in a, shortly. But if you like, what I'm trying to say is that the inflation is, well, I'll come to the picture. First of all, let me talk about what inflation doesn't do. One of the arguments for inflation really early on is that it was supposed to make the universe uh, smooth it out as the inflation takes place. I never believed that because of the following argument. Suppose you imagine a collapsing model of the universe. And you can put the inflaton field in if you like. Um, but the problem is that if you introduce irregularities into this model, it wouldn't look like that. It would look much more like that, where the black formation of irregularities, and these would cause black holes, and these would collide into each other and form one incredible mess of a singularity at the end. Whether or not you put the inflaton field, I'm not aware that the inflaton field is meant to stop black holes forming. If it did, then we're in real trouble in other, all sorts of other respects. So it seems to me that you have a picture just like this, whether you have inflatons or not. And this would represent an enormous increase in the entropy, and the most or increase in the probability of that final state. And so it's a much more likely state than the very smooth one that we just imagined previously. Let's hope I get my backwards 
working. Yes. So you see that is a very, very particular case, and the probability of that as opposed to that is about one part in 10 to the power, 10 to the power, something like 124, where you consider the entropy of black holes and, and so on and so forth, and that's where you, the figure comes from. And so uh, this is extremely likely as composed, compared to the other. And so why is that not the most likely initial state rather than what we seem to see, which is more like that? So I've always regarded this as a huge problem, and inflation, put the infraton field in or not, it doesn't have any effect on trying to get rid of that. Uh, it hardly makes any difference at all, as far as I can see. Usually when one talks about inflation, you more or less consider that it's pretty well uh, like a Friedman type of, a uh, Lemaitre, Friedman, a Robertson Walker type of model, and uh, then you, you more or less throw the baby out with the bathwater. So anyway, that's one of the reasons for inflation, which I don't believe, namely that it produces a uniform model. Um, other things which I may come to later. But let me consider now uh, this picture. That's, I've just used another Escher picture. It doesn't make much difference. That one's a little bit clearer if you want to talk about the hyperbolic geometry, because you can see the straight lines in the geometry are circles which meet the boundary orthogonally, and you can see lots of those by following the fish around in appropriate ways. But uh, the main point about the picture is that it's a conformal picture. So in particular, the eyes of these fish, fish creatures are circles, and they remain circles very as, the close, as close to the boundary as you want to get. And the shapes of them, apart from slight distortions, if you think of the angles on the, the wings or the fins or whatever they are of the fish, then you find that those angles are exactly the same, how far near to the boundary they are. But the point is that I want to make about this picture is you have the infinity represented. It's conformal infinity, which is the boundary, the circular boundary of this picture. And uh, it's a useful thing to keep in mind, what well, I want to say, that it's a useful way of describing infinity if you're prepared to look at things conformally. Uh, you have a nice smooth boundary, if you're lucky at least, and that nice smooth boundary um, is something that you could imagine there might be another side to it. So you could imagine if you uh, were not, uh, if you didn't respect the metric geometry, but the you, just the conformal geometry, well then you could step outside to uh, the place which is not represented as the part of the universe here, and that would be a smooth transition even though it would be the infinity of the, of the fish creatures. Okay, we'll come back to that. But in space-time, you need to think of what does conformal mean. Well, conformal really means the light cones or the null cones. And here at the top, I have a description of what a null cone looks like. And the second picture represents Minkowski space. And the one before, these light cones are not uniformly distributed. But that's really the conformal geometry <coughs> are those cones. And the cones are... Basically, if you look at the metric, the metric has 10 components per point, and roughly speaking, nine of them give you the light cones, and one gives you the scale. When I say nine of them, I really mean the nine independent ratios <coughs> of those 10 components, and those nine independent ratios determine the light, light cone structure of space-time. So the conformal structure is the light cone structure. Well, the top picture represents... What about the metric structure? Well, that's really the combining of the two most fundamental formulae of 20th century physics, namely Einstein's E equals mc squared, which is the second one, and the upper one, which is the Planck formula E equals h nu. And the, mind, the Einstein one, apart from c being a constant, tells you that mass and energy are equivalent. And the top one, the Planck formula, tells that mass and frequency are equivalent. Uh, h being a constant, and so therefore, putting them together, you see that um, mass and frequency are equivalent. So this tells you that if you have massive particles, they give you an extremely fundamental notion. Stable massive particle is a clock, and it's a very, very, very precise clock. If you want to have an atomic or nuclear clock, it ultimately depends on this. Of course, you have to uh, 
get something where you, the frequency is much lower, so you can use it. But ultimately, it depends upon the combination of those two formulae. So we have a very clearly defined notion of a metric in addition to the light cones. But the point I want to make, if you look at the bottom picture, uh, that if you, you see the, we have a couple of clocks whizzing by there uh, at great speed uh, through the central point there. Uh, and the different clocks, the first tick of them is the first bowl-shaped surface, and the second tick is the second one, and third is the third one, and so on. And the point is that the metric is the crowding of those uh, bowl-shaped surfaces. And of course, you have hill-shaped surfaces on the other side. I haven't drawn them. But um, the point is that the light cone is the conformal structure, and the crowding of those surfaces is the metric structure. And I want to separate those two things. And if you have something which the other side of the story is that if you have particles which have no mass, say a photon, then the photon zips along the light cone and it never even encounters the first of these surfaces and the, the uh, photon does not have any notion of, of the uh, metric structure. And in fact, the Maxwell equations are conformally invariant and so the Maxwell equations are completely insensitive to the uh, tenth number. It's the nine numbers which, which it respects. So the light cones, if you like, are what the Maxwell equations respect and not the other component. So if you have massless things, that's the sort of opposite side of the story. If you only had massless physics, then in a certain sense you'd be only interested in the light cones. You have to be a little careful about that, but that's the basic philosophy. Okay, so I have to try and remember what my next picture is. Yes. Now, this picture is, uh, the top of it is basically a version of the Escher picture, where I'm taking the conformal infinity, which in, you imagine this exponential expansion continues indefinitely, and then you can represent the entire future as something which is a, has a nice boundary. So we have at the top the boundary, like in the Escher picture, and that represents conformal infinity. This is something which I played with a long time ago, looking at uh, gravitational radiation, and it's a very way, good way of thinking about how uh, energy is carried away by gravitational waves and things like that, by looking at the conformally squashed infinity. But all the work that was done in the 1960s and so on, we didn't know there was a cosmological constant in those days, and we therefore had a null infinity. It makes a big difference. If you have a positive cosmological constant, then infinity is space-like, as represented in this picture. If you have a negative cosmological constant, it's time-like, and that's bad, bad news for all sorts of reasons. Uh, if you want to talk about uh, um, doing your boundary equations and thinking of how your independent degrees of freedom work, string theorists like negative cosmological constant, but I never liked it. The positive cosmological constant I wasn't too keen on until I got persuaded that there was really a cosmological constant. And when I, I think it was Jerry Ostreicher who persuaded me uh, to take seriously, I was at that time that the evidence for the positive cosmological constant or the mysterious dark energy it used to be called, or still is, I suppose, um, I thought it's just confirmation of the Einstein introducing the cosmological constant in 1917 for the wrong reason, admittedly, but nevertheless, it's the one thing you can do to the field equations which, without wrecking them, in my view. So, uh, sure, you can have a cosmological constant. It makes a lot of things that we did in the 60s. Uh, you have to think all over again. How do you do energy momentum and all that sort of thing? And I don't think there is a, a clear answer to those questions at the moment. Nevertheless, uh, we do seem to have a positive cosmological constant or something very like that, and this would give you a space-like conformal infinity. Now, what about the beginning? That is a completely different story. If you take the standard cosmologies, the Roberts, Friedman, Lemaitre, Robertson, Walker type of model, uh, where you have complete uh, isotropy and homogeneity in the spatial degrees of freedom, then you do have uh, a, a Big Bang, which you can stretch out and is space-like. And, uh, and it was uh, important to me to understand these things because 
I think Wolfgang Rindler had written a paper which explained the difference between the particle horizons and the event horizons. And I think there was a lot of confusion between the two. I'm not sure there still isn't a lot of confusion between the two. But I was convinced that what he was saying was clearly simply a matter of whether you were talking about past, Big Bang that is, or the future infinity, and the horizons arise because they're space-like. So you have a space-like Big Bang, you have particle horizons. If you have a space-like infinity, you have event horizons. And that was very clear. And you can see in the conformal picture, it makes a lot of sense. Now, <laughs> there was this question, of course, about whether the Big Bang is really like that or not. And let me come to the, the main story involved there. Let me try and move right forwards. I hope I do this correctly. Well, of course, this is uh, the famous Planck curve. And uh, one of the, the two things that got the Nobel Prize, I guess, for the um, discovery of the microwave background and the implications it has for cosmology. And uh, what we see here, we see, I always regard this as a sort of, not exactly a par paradox, but it's the mammoth in the room or something. That the second law of thermodynamics, what does it tell you? Well, it tells you that the entropy increases with time, or roughly speaking, randomness increases with time. Then that, another way of saying exactly the same thing is if you go back in time, then the entropy decreases, and it decreases and decreases until you see the earliest thing that you see, the radiation directly coming to us. And that is, uh, you look at the radiation and you see this wonderful Planck curve. And what's that telling you? You're telling you're looking at maximum entropy. So you go back, back, down and down and down and down and into the past until you reach the last thing you see directly. And instead of the entropy coming down, you seem to see a maximum. And why should the maximum be the starting point? <clears throat> and this was always <clears throat> a big confusion to me. And I couldn't understand why cosmologists weren't more confused about it. Well, it's not a paradox. It's just a puzzle. It's not a paradox because what's it telling you? It's telling you that the matter and radiation are basically in a maximum entropy state. Of course, the universe is expanding, so you've got to worry about that too. But that's not the point, as Tolman very clearly expressed. That's not the point. Um, you can take into account the expansion of the universe, and that doesn't make any difference. The key point is that, that matter and radiation are indeed in a maximally random state. But the other thing, which looks random at first, is if you look at the, un the uniformity over the whole sky of the microwave background, that's pretty, not exactly uniform, but pretty close to uniform. And if it was just a gas in a box, well, here's the next picture. The top three pictures indicate what the second law of th th thermodynamics does if you have a gas in a box. So the entropy is increasing from left to right. And the top three pictures, you see, you imagine you had a gas which was initially constrained by some kind of container to be in one corner of the box. You open, the, you open up the container, and the gas spreads out through the box. So entropy increasing corresponds to increasing uniformity. But if you imagine, on the other hand, you have, say, a galactic scale box, and this box contains a lot of stars, and you then see what entropy does. When the gravity begins to take effect, these things will clump until finally you get a black hole. And you have increasing entropy from left to right, just as in the above. But the picture looks completely different. The picture looks more and more clumpy from left to right, whereas for a gas in a box, it looks less and less clumpy. So what we seem to see is uniformity over the sky, which is consistent with top left picture and bottom right picture. And that is what we see. But as far as gravity is concerned, it is very low entropy. So that there is this enormous puzzle, which is why was gravity different? Why was gravity somehow aloof from the thermalization, which maybe would get us to a uniform distribution? And you were given with a very low entropy state as far as gravity was concerned. And then you can begin to quantify that by thinking about what the black hole is. You see the clumping until you get a black hole. And then you have the Bekenstein-Hawking formula, which tells you how much entropy there is in a black hole. And that tells you how much potential there is to the entropy. I shouldn't say potential. You're a little bit careful about the word. But I'm saying that potentially, 
you have an enormously large phase space because when you get black holes, the entropy goes shooting up, and so you have that potential that the black hole, uh, that the entropy is in fact extraordinarily low at the beginning compared with what it might be. And this is the puzzle. And it all seemed to me to be a huge puzzle why the entropy was low at the beginning. And inflation, as I was trying to indicate earlier, does not solve that puzzle. And I know people take that seriously. Something you think about inter eternal inflation, and you say maybe they were, the initial state where there was a little stretch which was very smooth, and maybe that was our universe, and so on. Those arguments don't really work when you think about them seriously, but let's not go into that. Um, anyway, this is the conundrum, as I was uh, felt was a real problem for cosmology, and no matter how complacent one might be about the standard picture of cosmology, it does not address this fundamental puzzle. Now, just to point out that, of course, people, this is really Schrodinger who pointed out that what we get from the sun is not energy, and people often think we get energy from the sun, and that causes all the, the life and wonderful things that we have on this planet. The point is that we get the energy from the sun in a, high, uh, in a low entropy form, and we can think of that as the sun is a hot spot in the dark sky, and we, the, essentially the same amount of energy comes in from the sun as goes out at night or during the day as well. Uh, but it goes away into the dark sky, and the dark sky is lower temperature, and therefore you need many, many more photons to carry the same amount of energy going out, and many fewer photons coming in. So the, sun comes, the energy comes in in the form of small number of very highly energetic photons, and it goes away in the terms of many, many more photons, relatively speaking, individually less energy, and therefore more of them. And this is the key point, and this is what plants live off, and we live off the plants and the animals and so on, and it all works because of the sun being a hot spot in a dark sky. If the whole sky was illuminated at the same temperature as the sun, it would be utterly useless. The use we make out of it is this imbalance and this imbalance comes about because the sun is there at all. Of course, there are nuclear processes going on in the sun, but the key point is that it's there at all. And even if it were not for nuclear processes, you would have a, for a much shorter time, but you still have a hot spot in the sky. And that comes about because the sun has condensed from a previously uniform distribution of matter. So I'm just trying to say that the, the fact that we live off this low entropy, it's the fact that the sun and the background sky are imbalanced, not the fact that the sun is a source of heat. That's not the story. The story is the imbalance between the two. And this comes about because of the gravitational clumping that is potentially available because of the uniformity that was there before. OK, so that's basically the story. And that is the justification, if you like, for this picture. The top part comes about very naturally and in detailed calculations due to Helmut Friedrich, you can consider an expanding universe with degrees of freedom in massless fields, such as electromagnetism, and they tend to smooth themselves out, and you get this conformal boundary, which is a very natural thing in the future. In the past, it's a very unnatural thing if you say what's likely is what we seem to see, and I used to postulate uh, the, what I call the vial curvature hypothesis, which was just a postulate. It says, okay, that the vial curvature, the conformal curvature, is zero in the initial state. Um, and I used to think that, like everybody else, that the singularities in space-time had to be explained by quantum gravity. But I found this extremely puzzling because the singularity in the past, the Big Bang, is extraordinarily different from the singularities in black holes, utterly different. And in the black holes, you expect a completely wildly diverging vial curvature, um, whereas in the past, it's completely tame, and the vial curvature seems to be zero. And uh, this, if this is the result of quantum gravity, it must be an extraordinarily peculiar theory of quantum theory, not like any normal quantum theory. And I used to think, well, maybe it is a very peculiarly strange theory of quantum gravity. But the point of view I'm adopting now is a different one, but it's taking into account that the Big Bang just was, for whatever reason, very special, and something like the vial curvature vanishes. Well, my 
at that time student, Paul Todd, had a way of phrasing this differently, which I thought about it a bit, but he really did it and worked out the equations and so on. And his argument was, instead of talking about the vial curvature, which is a little bit difficult to say, what do you mean by the curvature being zero when it says a singularity when you don't even know what the curvature means? Uh, whereas if you phrase it differently, you say that the Big Bang, for whatever reason, could be conformally extended to something before it. Now, it's simply a mathematical trick. I'm not saying that in his proposal there was something before the Big Bang. It's just saying that the mathematical condition on the Big Bang that is nice to impose is to say that it's conformally extendable. OK, well, my proposal actually goes from that, but a little bit further. What is it conformally extendable into? Well, the picture is this one. So I'm saying that the conformal extension of the Big Bang is into the remote future of a previous eon. I'm calling each one of these universe phases an eon, spelled A-E-O-N. This is a, a perfectly good word in English. I guess it comes from the Greek and Plato and things like that. But uh, the point is that, uh, I mean, I looked it up in the, in the Oxford Dictionary to see how long an eon was, and I was glad to see that it wasn't any, it's an awful long time, but it's not any particular length of time. So it doesn't mean a certain number of years or anything like that. And so I'm allowed to say, I hope, that my cosmical eon, or cosmic eon, is in fact an infinite time in the ordinary way of measuring time. Uh, but you take the infinite time in the future, that is, a finite time in the past, but an infinite time in the future, and that is the eon. Now, the remote future of each eon conformally, smoothly, extends to the conformally stretched Big Bang of the next eon. And that is the hypothesis of co conformal cyclic cosmology. So this is a picture representing conformal cyclic cosmology. And then you have to explore various things. Well, the first point about it is that in this picture, it's not just that the vial curvature, you see, in, in Paul Todd's description, the Big Bang is just extendable. And that means that the conformal curvature is smooth at the Big Bang. It doesn't say it's zero. It just says it's smooth. But in this picture, it's stronger. It says it's got to be zero. And the reason comes about because if you look up what the vial curvature does in the remote future of the previous eon, you find it does go to zero. And this comes from something which puzzled me very much when I was thinking about um, conformal infinities and things like that. And that is that the vial curvature has two different conformal scalings. It depends on how you're looking at it. If you're thinking of the vial curvature representing the strength of gravity in a gravitational wave, and that gravitational wave is going out to infinity, the equations in the weak field limit governing the gravitational propagation of these prop gravitational waves simply follows the same as what happens with Maxwell's equations in any other massless field. Uh, you look at the massless field, and, the, and you have a conformally invariant wave equation. And this conformal invariance is given by one particular conformal factor. So if you're looking at it, if you like, as how gravitons behave or something gravitational waves behave at infinity, you get one conformal factor. And that tells you that the gravitational waves scale so that they have a finite value at infinity. That's the strength. But the other way in which it scales, because the vial curvature is the conformal curvature, and since it's the conformal curvature, it's got a definite way of scaling. And you find that's different. The difference by a factor of the conformal factor, one power of the conformal factor, and it tells you that if the gravitational radiation remains as a finite thing at the crossover, the actual vial curvature is zero. And you see this in Helmut Friedrich's analysis and so on, that the vial curvature is zero at infinity. And therefore, to match it as a nicely conformal smooth thing onto the next eon, the vial curvature has to be zero. So it does satisfy a vial curvature hypothesis of the form that I was trying to promote earlier, that the vial curvature is zero at the beginning of each eon. OK, so that's rather nice, in my view. Um, but uh, OK. Now, there are various things you might query. Let me um, talk about 
the black holes first. Here's a black hole. And as you know, we are probably familiar with this picture, uh, the original um, uh, Oppenheimer-Snyder model was basically something like this in the future of this picture. And this is a standard picture, spherically symmetrical collapse. Of course, in general, it will not be spherically symmetrical. And you don't have a nice uh, singularity in the middle, which is spherically symmetrical. It could be a great mess, maybe BKL solution or all sorts of things. Um, but nevertheless, you see what the conformal picture is and with the light cones tipping over and uh, at the horizon becoming the outer boundary of the light cones being uh, vertical in the picture. And so you can see that things can't escape without going faster than light. So that's a nice way of understanding black holes. And what happens according to... Well, here the, I've put the black holes now in the picture. Not... Yeah, well, there could be something like that. So you imagine the black hole singularities, uh, the singularities drawn in red, something like that. Now, Stephen Hawking told us something else, namely that if you wait long enough, then the black hole will evaporate away. Now, the Hawking temperature for a black hole, any kind of black hole that we know about from normal astrophysical considerations, maybe a few solar masses, is, uh, the temperature is extremely cold, radiation is ridiculously tiny, um, and you would not see any significant effect. But you have to wait until the universe expands and expands and expands. I guess the temperature of the black hole, you have to think of something like the coldest temperature ever made on the Earth. I'm not quite sure. We've probably got colder than it now. But something like that as the sort of temperature that you might see for a black hole, uh, astrophysical black hole. But certainly, when they get big and they get sort of the supermassive black holes that we seem to find in centers of galaxies, that temperature is ridiculously small. Nevertheless, the universe expands and expands and expands, and the temperature, ambient temperature, goes down and down and down, and ultimately gets less than the temperature of the black hole. And then the black hole starts to lose its radiation, uh, so it loses its energy and therefore loses its mass, and ultimately will evaporate away. Uh, I don't know what the current estimates on this now, since we seem to keep seeing bigger and bigger black holes. In this picture, I was thinking of a 10 to the 100 years, or what people call a Google years. 10 to the 100 years seems like an awful long time, but I gather that the sizes of supermassive black holes that we now seem to see, that they're much longer time than that must be expected. But nevertheless, if you're waiting forever, infinity, any finite time is still a short period of time. And so the black holes will ultimately disappear according to Hawking evaporation. They will disappear with what I call a pop. Well, how you consider, if it's the last Planck mass, then the pop is like an, uh, a larger artillery shell. So it would be rather unpleasant if it went off in this room. But it would not be very much from a cosmological perspective. Maybe you look at the last few seconds or something, and then you've got a nuclear explosion. Still nothing compared with the sort of energies one's considering. So I've called it a pop, and that is the fate of the black hole eventually. Almost the entire mass energy of that black hole goes in the Hawking radiation. Now, this is the thing that used to worry me quite a bit, because you've got all that, the entire mass. You see, you have to think about what people expect in the future. Well, we have a in our galaxy, a black hole, which is about, um, what was it, uh, four million times the mass of the sun, four million solar masses. Uh, the Andromeda galaxy has one, I think, about 40 times bigger or something. And you see the others, which are much, much bigger than that. And so those supermassive black holes uh, will be around for a long time, but eventually they disappear. And I guess I've got a picture of this. Uh, that's not where I push. I'm going to do it this way, don't I? I have, now, this is certainly not to scale. <laughs> I'm having them pop, disappearing with a pop, but in that picture, it would be way, 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 way into the future, not to scale by any means. But nevertheless, the idea is once they've all gone, what you've got basically is a universe full of photons, and that's conformally invariant. OK, you will have the likelihood, as far as I can see, I don't know what people's calculations are, but if you have a cluster of galaxies, then the black holes will gradually swallow each other up, and you will end up with one super-duper massive black hole, 
which will start to drink the galaxy, the cluster, until probably not much left except for photons escaping. And uh, certainly there will be some intergalactic hydrogen and things like that. But uh, on the whole, as far as particle number is concerned, it would be completely dominated by photons, and they're conformally invariant. But nevertheless, you will have some massive particles. I can't quite remember what the next picture is. Yes. I'll come to that in a minute. There you will have some massive particles around, and I did worry about them because, after all, if you're trying to say that the physics in the remote future, you're, you have no massive particles around, that's not quite true. It will certainly be dominated, as far as numbers concerned, by photons, but you will still have a few rogue electrons and positrons, or maybe the protons decay, but you've still got the positive charge, so you'll probably end up with positrons or something. And what you do with the rogue electrons and positrons? Well, what I say, again, it's a hypothesis, is that there is an ultimate mass fade out. I don't know how necessary that is for the picture, but it is for my peace of mind, if you like, that the mass certainly can't, you can't have massless particles um, which are charged now that would spoil things like par annihilation, and I think and quantum field theory calculations show that can't be true, but you can have an asymptotic fade out of mass, and the sort of justification for that is that if you consider the, see in particle physics you, you've got the two Casimir uh, operators in the Poincaré group, you say the Poincaré group is the first thing you use for classification of particles, and you say you've got mass and spin as the two Casimirs, so a stable particle should have a definite mass. But if you consider the cosmological constant being part of the picture, which I do, then the group is not really the Poincaré group, it's the group with the de Sitter group, and the Casimir operators of the de Sitter group do not include mass. The mass is corrected, it's not quite a Casimir operator. So the argument is that maybe on huge timescales you will have a fade out of the mass. That's a, a hypothesis which I don't know how strongly it plays a role in the picture, but I like to think of it as happening. So ultimately the mass does go to zero, but only asymptotically. And in the Big Bang, you have the opposite situation because the, in the Big Bang, um, you have uh, very uh, high temperatures, and those very high temperatures mean that the, and it gets higher and higher the closer you get to the Big Bang, it means that the energy of individual particles is completely dominated by the motion and the mass becomes utterly unimportant. So in the limit, again, you would have massless things and the argument is that uh, you can consider that the form conformal picture makes sense at both ends. And so although it's a limiting thing, as you approach the boundary at both ends, the argument is that you have a conformal picture for the physics, and this allows your crossover from one to the next to be described in terms of conformal physics. Although if you look at the equations, you want the cosmological constant to be a constant right the way through. So this is a a particular thing I insist on is the cosmological constant is a constant and, and this governs the way that the equations work as you go from one eon to the next. I, I could talk about that later, but let's just show you the pictures first. Now, I often would talk about these things through lectures and I thought, well, it's perfectly safe. I can talk about cosmic conformal, concyclic, conformal cyclic cosmology uh, uh, to the end of time because nobody will ever be able to disprove me. And uh, then I began to think, is that true? And so I began to think, maybe you can have a test of this theory. And so this picture represents the idea I had about how you might test conformal cyclic cosmology. And the picture is, well, you think of our galaxy, for example, which has its supermassive black hole, and you think of the Andromeda galaxy, which is apparently on a collision course with us. So in a few thousand million years, they will come together and uh, go through each other or merge to some degree. And the black holes will probably feel each other out. And maybe you might have to go through a few times. I don't know. The black holes will feel each other out and eventually spiral in into each other 
and there will be one big explosion in the form of gravitational radiation. And that gravitational radiation will happen when many, many times when supermassive black holes encounter each other, and there will be gravitational waves coming out. So you see the bottom, the horizontal plane in this picture represents the crossover. Pre, before the horizontal plane, below it in the picture is the previous eon. Above it in the picture is our eon. You see us up there in the top right-hand corner. Looking back, our past light cone hits the crossover surface and intersects the, the gravitational wave signals coming from the encounters between supermassive black holes. Now, I'm imagining that in a particular cluster, though this will happen several times. So if you have a cluster with many, many supermassive black holes, they will bang, bang, they will in various, various times. It may be a long time, but, but from the conformal picture, uh, they, they could be quite separated. And so you will see different signals, and they will be more or less, from our back perspective, then you look at the intersections of these two. If you want to visualize it, you think of that plane crossing across as a three-dimensional surface, and the r pass light cone is a sphere in that three-dimensional surface. Think of it as Euclidean three space. r pass light cone is a sphere, and the gravitational radiation waves coming out from the collisions are a set of concentric spheres, and those concentric spheres intersect our pass light cone sphere in what look like concentric circles. So you would see a set of concentric circles. You have to ask what do the gravitational waves do, and then you have to look at equations. What happens is that the gravitational waves, because the vial curvature goes to zero, <coughs> basically the effect of them is, to, is a disturbance in the dark matter. I haven't talked about dark matter yet, but in this picture, what you have to have, and you look at the equations again, and what you have to have in order to make the equations work is the creation of a scalar material, which I consider to be dark matter. Now, this dark matter has to be the dominant material in the universe. And initially, I guess it's massless, but I suppose by some kind of Higgs process or something, and I don't know how to describe the details of that, it would acquire a mass. And I conjecture that the mass of this would be something like a Planck mass. And the reason I say that is that the only physics in the picture is gravity. There's nothing else. So, OK, you could have electromagnetism. You could have strong forces, weak forces, all these things. But the picture, the equations you're talking about, simply are about gravity. And so the dark matter is a gravitational thing. It only interacts gravitationally. It would, um, and dark matter, as far as we know, does only interact gravitationally. It, the, the mass of the dark matter particles would have to be a gravitational thing. So the suggestion is, and this would need more, more looking at, but the suggestion is it's something like particles of about a Planck mass, something like that. And they would have to decay because you don't want the dark matter to build up from one eon to the next. So they'd have to have gone completely by the time you cross over again. And the idea is in the decay process, the, you get um, signals which are what would cause the... Um, you see, if you go back to inflation and all that sort of thing, one of the main reasons that inflation has been around for all this length of time, in my view, is that nobody could think of any other explanation for the scale invariance of the cosmic microwave background fluctuations in temperature. So you see these fluctuations and you see these temperature, the scale invariance, uh, the flat spectrum you get, which tells you that different scales, you get the same phenomenon. So the argument is you have something uh, scale invariant, like an exponential expansion, and the infanton field is supposed to give you this effect. If you don't have inflation, which I may say you can't have in this picture, because inflation would spread the... You see, here I have the crossover as a, as a plane. If you have inflation, it would stretch it out, and so you simply lose everything. However, in this picture, there is no inflation, and the inflation has to be taken over by the cosmic the expansion of the previous eon. So when I say there is no exponential expansion um, after the Big Bang, I'm saying, no, it's not that. It's what looks like an exp exponential expansion after the Big Bang. What it really is, 
is you're looking through the Big Bang to the exponential expansion of the previous eon, which is due to Einstein's cosmological constant. But it's, you think of it as on a small scale because, because of the conformal factor, which makes it look as though it was a small scale. Of course, there are lots of details there which need to be worked out. And I haven't worked out a lot of the details. I think there's a lot of work for people to do to make sure it makes sense. So the argument here is that you should see um, these rings, which would be the impulses, basically impulsive. Uh, the way the scale works, of course, the black holes may take quite a long time to spiral into each other. But because of the conformal squashing, that's almost instantaneous. So it would be like an impulsive release of energy in the form of highly oscillating from the perspective of the hour one on the top. It would look like uh, almost inst instantaneous. And you would, I should say they would look warmer or cooler. You see, if the event is far away from us, then the radiation is coming towards us. And if it's coming towards us, then it looks blue shifted because it's coming towards us. And if the, you look at the pictures and color codings, and let me, I'll show you a picture here. This was a picture produced by my Armenian colleague, Vahe Guzijan. And what he was looking for was concentric rings. So I was saying, if you have lots of events, you should see concentric rings. So he's looking for at least three rings, which are concentric. And he was looking for rings which have low variance. So he wasn't looking for higher temperature or lower temperature. He was looking for low variance. And so you could either have higher or lower temperature. And the low variance is also an implication of the theory. So you, it's, it's a reasonable thing to look for. Um, but you can see that the ones which are red in this picture, the color coding is, means red is more energetic and therefore blue shifted. You have to get your mind around this. The red ones are blue shifted. And they're blue shifted in the theory because they're distant, because the radiation is then coming towards us. So that's also backwards. You think of red shifting for different ones. So the ones that are red are actually the very distant ones in the theory. So the red ones are the distant ones, and the, and the blue ones are the, are the nearer ones. It's, uh, this is W map picture. He did it also for the uh, Planck map, the Clamp satellite picture. And then the crowding, I was very surprised by the crowding. I was expecting to see a uniform picture. But what you see is a very non-uniform picture, which is very striking. It's not what I expected, but it's certainly explicable on the theory. It tells you that the distribution of supermassive black holes or clusters of supermassive black holes is not very uniform. OK, there's no reason why it should be very uniform in the model. But if you have a standard model, this is a great puzzle. Now, I should say that. Some people, Douglas Scott and company, redid the analysis here. They found basically the same picture. So I was relieved to see that, because I have no idea. <laughs> and they found basically the same picture. But they tried to say, oh, no, it's random, or nothing to be surprised about. I found that very puzzling. You just look at it. It's not random. And you look at the Planck picture, it's even more obviously not random. And it's even more obvious when you look at the centers. See, these are the centers of the triples of rings. And you see it's highly non-uniform. And you see there a great uh, collection of, of um, red ones, very distant. And what's striking about it is not only are they clumped in angular distribution, but they're clumped in temperature. Bear in mind, he was not looking for hot or cold. He was looking for low variance. But you see that they're clumped in temperature as well as clumped in position. Well, in the theory, that would mean, yeah, they're clumped in temperature, because that means the bottom ones on the right are relatively distant outside our particle horizon in the conventional cosmological picture. But that's all right here, because you can look outside our particle horizon. You're looking into the previous eon. And it means a distribution which is, as far as linear distance from us, is clumped also is angular distance. And the bluish one at the top right there, that's a relatively close one. And it's, again, clumped both in angular distribution and in color, which says, in theory, OK, they're relatively near. And then there's a sort of greenish one, I guess. I can't remember down over here somewhere. So you see 
regions where, according to the picture, these are, in the previous eon, super-duper clusters with very large black holes involved. OK. Now, that's one set of observations. What about the Hawking points? Now, you see, I didn't worry about them too much, or I worried about them, but didn't face up to them. I knew, I knew that they would be a problem, because you have these concentrations of mass. You see, I sort of didn't, I, I non-worried for a while for a, for a bad reason, namely that the evaporation of supermassive black holes is basically photons. And see, so we don't mind about photons. But where, do those, where are those photons? Well, you remember the Escher picture. Everything is happening very close to that boundary. And when you think of how far does the radiation in the picture spread out, almost nothing. So from our perspective, above this, looking back, it looks like a point. So the entire Hawking evaporation over, goodness knows, a Google years or more than that, is simply squashed into one tiny little point, probably smaller than a Planck scale or something on our side. So you have a burst of radiation coming through at that little point. And I didn't like to face up to that because I have no idea what it does. But um, this is more of the sort of picture. So here we imagine the two horizontal lines there. The bottom one is the crossover from P of previous eon to our eon. And then we have a point on that. That's the history of a supermassive black hole. And ev all the energy in that supermassive black hole all the radiation, all anything, whatever it is, Hawking evaporation would be most of it, but whatever it is, doesn't matter too much here, is concentrated into one point. So we have one burst, it's a huge explosion coming through there. If you had inflation, I should say, that would be the nice grace, that would have to be the graceful exit. You see, that is where inflation turns off. And it's not at all graceful because you have bursts, explosion coming through there, and this spreads out. OK, what do we see? We see the next la horizontal line above that. That is last scattering or decoupling. They're pretty well the same place. And that is where, what you see when you look back and you see the microwave radiation. 380,000 years between one line and the next line. In that 380,000 years, one point spreads out to four degrees in the sky, eight, tons, eight times the moon's diameter. So you would see a spot of that size. And at the top, you see a profile of what that thing would look like. OK, photons have a lot of trouble getting out. There's a lot going on there. So they bounce around before they get out. And there you have something like a Gaussian shape of, of, of a distribution. I'm sure you one could be more precise about the shape of that. But nevertheless, something like that. And then as we look back, we see a sort of section through that. And that section could be smaller than 4 degrees. It couldn't be bigger might be a bit smaller, but the smaller it is, the less energy it will, you would see. And so, roughly speaking, four degrees on the sky. OK. Now, oh, that's just the, uh, when people do their analysis to see whether something's a real effect or not. I mean, when Vahe did these analyses originally, he did it his own way, and I didn't know. It wasn't the way people did things normally. Um, but the normal way to do things is to feed in this power spectrum, and you, that's where you see the different harmonics. It's the L values as you go from left to right. And after about, after about 40 or so, you see a hugely uh, comforting um, agreement between observation and the theory. Well, what's that telling you? That's telling you the theory between the two horizontal lines in my previous picture is very good. That theory is very good. Great. I'm accepting that theory. And that would give us agreement with this spectrum here. OK, what the input is comes from inflation, is what, what happens at the bottom line there. And maybe that's something else. Um, inflation doesn't tell you very much about that thing, that curve. But when you're doing the, you, you want to see, is an effect really there or not? The official way of doing it is you make a huge number of fake skies. The fake skies have to agree with this power spectrum. But the, that's the L values in the harmonics. But the M values, as the, as the L values get bigger and bigger and bigger, um, when you, the L value is 100, then you have 100 different M values, or whatever it is. And, and you're allowed to play with the M values as much as you like. 
I guess my time's about up, is it? Or I was probably already up long ago. But let me just say what the analysis is. This is what my colleagues, Polish colleagues, Christoph Meisner and uh, Paweł Nierowski and uh, Daniel Ann, who is um, a Korean who works in New York, and he did all the hard work, the number crunching and everything. And Christoph has a way <coughs> of doing analysis, which is a very good way. And the argument is that you're ta what, what you're doing, I think the next picture is, is sort of showing what, 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 what one's doing. You look for rings, and you look for the top left picture. You have a certain radius of ring and the outer, inner and outer radius. And you're trying to see, does the temperature drop from the inner radius to the outer radius? And that's the argument. You look for particular sizes of inner and outer radii, and you see whether the temperature drop is something that the real sky shows up a phenomenon which you don't see in the fake skies. And the argument is, yes, indeed, it certainly does. Let me go back to this picture. Because if you take certain values, and those are the ones ringed here, Daniel did it first for a 1,000 simulations and found these zeros. What do the zeros mean? That means for certain ring sizes, you don't see a single one in the simulations which see the effect. In the, you don't see it, anything in the simulations which is strong as in the real sky. So that's, you look at the zeros and compare them with the numbers around the zeros, see the big numbers in the hundreds or whatever it is, and suddenly zero. Very striking. This tells you there's something there. Um, and then he did another 9,000 simulations, so 10,000 altogether, to see whether this was a real effect. And you see, instead of zero, I think for one scale, one and the other two. That gives you some indication of how real the effect is. And it tells you that the effect is there with a 99.8% confidence. So this is telling you, in the sky, for those particular sizes of rings, you see a huge effect. And this is exactly what you'd expect from the... I should say that you can look and see which points in the sky you're, see, you're looking at the big effect. And Daniel looked for that, and for the five strongest points... He did the analysis all over again. This was in the Planck data. He did all over again in the WMAP data. And for the five strongest points, they were in exactly the same places. So these points are there. And they are there. And it's very strange from the general picture why they should be there. And they are ring sizes of the ones I've indicated there. And a slightly weaker signal for ones like this. But you do see a, a significant signal for the, for the one at the bottom. But the argument was mainly based on the top two, which is where you saw the zeros are, are the ones and the twos. And that gives you the confidence of, well, this is the size of it. And that size is eight, it's four degrees across the sky. And so when I say eight times the size of the moon, that is what you're seeing. And if you had microwave eyes, I think you would see these spots. The, the, size, the, raise in the raising of the temperature is about um, 15 times the normal 10 to the minus 5 temperature fluctuations. So I guess you would... I would like to see in a planetarium somebody show you what the microwave sky looks like, and you could look up, and you could see, could you see the Hawking points? I would really love to see that if somebody would do it. Thank you very much. Bon, alors, ah, on n'a même pas besoin de demander s'il y a des questions, ça. Thank you for your great talk, Roger. We do have a planetarium upstairs, which is a, a beautiful ceiling on the second floor with the planet. Oh, that so, would be nice. Uh, Could I somebody do it? Look at it. <laughs> I uh, mean, usually when you look at the pictures, they put with this elliptical shape. Yeah, it's elliptical. It's so much too small. Yes. The moon would look like a speck. Okay. So I'd like to see it spread out. And it would be very intriguing to see whether you could see them, actually. Yes. OK. So, <laughs> so I had a question about the beginning of your talk, yes. where you were extending the current universe backwards. And, um, and I was wondering whether, by doing that, you were assuming time reversibility of equations. And if so, what ha are you assuming that the arrow of entropy is reversed? 
that uh, no. so maybe I misunderstood. Well, you see, there are schemes with pre Big Bangs, and I believe uh, uh, Turok has a, has a. I'm not sure that he's with Steinhardt, but Turok and Steinhardt collaborate a lot on these things. And certainly, a sort of model they consider is that it goes symmetrically the other side. But that doesn't explain why the vowel curvature is zero on the crossover. I mean, I see no reason why that. So the model I have is I don't have any requirement that the physics is time asymmetrical. It may be, but there's not a requirement. The asymmetry comes about just from the setup. It just keeps propagating this way. And you don't need to have an asymmetrical, time asymmetrical physics. I, I would say I have an open mind on that. It may be that the physics is time asymmetrical, but I don't see a requirement for it in this, in this model. It's just the way that the equations are realized in, 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 in the picture. It's automatically time asymmetrical, but not that the f detailed physics is time as asymmetrical. But as I say, I have an open mind on that. D'autres questions Où ça ah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, um, so, uh, in the um, past, uh, in the past, uh, you conformally extend. Yes. Math as you said, mathematically conformal extend. Yeah. Uh, to have uh, maybe a well curvature very small if not a zero. So, uh, the, um, this, uh, um, so this uh, give uh, uh, the, um, then is connected with the future or the end set yeah. of another universe, of another whatever yeah. you, you could yes. call. Sure. And so the switch, uh, the switch from one to another and in which also the, super, the end of supermassive black holes, uh, you talk, uh, uh, could be, or uh, in your model, will be the uh, Hawking point set, or the circles. It could be also that uh, are the primordial black holes of one uh, beginning who uh, give the end uh, of this, I mean, the, uh, the, the circles too because this, uh, or these small black holes, which will be more probably uh, uh, explode uh, in some sense by Hawking radiation. So in some sense, it's a symmetry or a, uh, a quasi-symmetry between the pictures from right. the beginning yeah. and from the end. Well, it's and not my picture. Point. Uh, sorry, yes, sorry, did you finish? Yes. And, no, I, yes. Uh, sorry, yes. No, you see, in this picture, I don't have primordial black holes. No, they would, I mean, there's no reason for them, because if you're away from the Hawking points, so the Hawking points are a story on their own, but suppose you're elsewhere. Elsewhere, you have a very smooth transition, and there's no reason to expect suddenly points with large vial curvature come about. In fact, the picture I have is you follow the equations from one side to the other, and you have a choice. You could use the old conformal factor or a new conformal factor. And I should say the new one is, is the minus the inverse of the old one. But if you take the old conformal factor, you find that, in effect, the gravitational constant has changed sign. So it's a way that the conformal transformations work. A positive mass object would become negative mass on the other yeah. side. And so the argument is that that's, nature doesn't like that. So it pref prefers the other cosmological constant. Sorry, it prefers the other conformal factor. And the other conformal factor, see, if you chose the original conformal factor, it would look as though you have an expanding universe, and then you cross over, it's now a contracting universe. And what I'm saying, it's not a nice contracting universe because the effective gravitational constant has become negative. And so you would say that, okay, nature doesn't like that, and it prefers the other conformal factor. In the other conformal factor, you get a positive gravitational constant, but it now looks like an expanding model. I mean, that's not clear. I, that's the sort of 
picture I have is that you could follow the old conformal factor if you like, but it becomes less and less relevant to what the physical world is doing. And what the physical world is doing, it likes to retain gravitational effects being positive. And then you need the other conformal factor. And so it looks like an expansion. So uh, I don't know how models like the Turok model, where you somehow have, I guess, an expansion on both sides. Again, you would have that problem if it's conformal continuation, that the gravitational constant would have reversed on the other side. I don't know that they've considered that effect. <coughs> so there is a problem about that. But it would be nice to look at. I mean, there are lots of things that I would like people to look at, and I have not had the chance to do. Um, I say it's not controversial yet because not nobody is working on it except people on one side of the story. <laughs> yes. OK. Do we have like important questions? Or maybe we should stop there. As I said, round 3 PM, we will meet in the, probably in the, in, the co yeah, in the forum. For those who have questions, and if you want to discuss this or other issues about quantum mechanics with Roger, he will be here for an hour and a half to discuss with you. So thank you very much for, for your talks. Okay. Okay. Okay.